we ask you to guide and bless the United States of America, preserve our freedom, and maintain our religious liberty. Watch over all your little ones, especially innocent life in the womb. May we serve you in peace and prosperity as we continue as one nation, living consciously under your providence and protection. Watch over our men and women in the armed services, especially those who serve in harm's way. Give comfort and reassurance to their families at home. Inspire the electorate and give wisdom to our political and judicial leaders. Help us in all our needs. We pray as always, guided by your Holy Spirit and confident in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I'll give you a little tiny history lesson, I'm sure you all know. Uh, after we won the revolution against Great Britain, we were governed by the Articles of Confederation, which didn't work. So eventually we adopted the Constitution of the United States and elected George Washington as our first president. Within months of his assumption of that office, he got a letter from the Pope. Uh, at that time, the Pope was Pope Pius VI, and he said, Your Excellency, Mr. President, who do you want to appoint as the first bishop of the Catholic Church in the United States? He wasn't being disingenuous. In Europe, they had canon law governing uh, how bishops were appointed, but in fact, the leaders of the state appointed them. You could even have uh, Catholic rulers appointing the higher clergy among Protestant churches, and Protestant rulers appointing Catholics, and in Catholic countries, it was the king, the princes, who appointed the bishops. And the president wrote back a very polite letter. He said, in the United States of America, we have religious freedom. Please appoint whoever you want. And after consultation with the clergy and the lady, the Pope appointed John Carroll, whose brother had signed the Declaration of Independence, and whose people had been active in the American Revolution. We know, of course, that religious liberty was later enshrined in the Bill of Rights, especially in the First Amendment. The First Amendment says, in this country we will have no state church. We will not have a religion everyone must belong to. We are free to go to the faith of our choice or no faith. Uh, but there's another part, of course, of that First Amendment, and that is the state is not to involve itself in the eternal affairs of religious faiths. And by the way, there is nothing, nothing in that First Amendment that bars religious practice in the public forum. No church is to be given priority, but historically churches have always been able to witness in public and participate in the common life of citizens. We all know all of that is under threat today. Uh, the HHS mandates do a number of things. One is they would ask religious bodies to help fund things we believe are immoral, especially the destruction of innocent human life. That's a moral absolute for many of us. It is an area where we may not and will not compromise. But there's a second part to those mandates. And that is, they tend to try to define what is religious ministry. They say the church buildings are exempt, but not schools, not apostolates, not charities, not hospitals. They are not exempt, and they define who is a minister. Now, I will give you the example of the Catholic schools in Chicago. They have schools all over the city. They are the most integrated schools in that area because neighborhood schools tend to be segregated. Uh, many in the inner part of the city, the students are not Catholic. Uh, the church sacrifices a lot of time, talent, and treasure to do a ministry for Christ, to teach. Many of the parents are 
Baptist or Assemblies of God, but they want their children educated in a faith-based institution. And the church teaches in those places because it is honoring the Lord to teach and to do something a little braggadocious. The Catholic Church does pretty well, runs schools. They are not, according to HHS defined, as an apostolate. My, my own University of Notre Dame, which is also suing the government, uh, was founded in 1842. In those early days, the majority of students, and it was more a grammar school, high school, than a college in those days, were not Catholic. Uh, they've always had not Catholic professors, even back in the early days. In the, about 1850, they hired a professor of business who happened to be Jewish. And he said to Father Soren, the founder of the university, how can you have me teaching here? And he said, you teach business, we'll teach religion. It never seemed inappropriate that that university would have people of different faiths, students of different faiths, although the majority of students there are Catholic, and it is founded to be a religious school. I'll read one more thing, and this happens to appear in most of the schools in our diocese, but it comes from St. Phil's. Every time I go into the gym there, I, I always give Father Richardson a bit of a hand because it's prominently displayed, but it's displayed everywhere. And it says what we're about in Catholic education. Be it known to all who enter here that Christ is the reason for this school. He is the unseen but ever-present teacher in its classes. He is the model and the inspiration of its students. Frankly, that defines our religious schools, it defines our health services, it defines Catholic charities, it defines everything we endeavor to do to serve the Lord. And no government has the authority to tell us what we're doing is not in the service of Jesus Christ. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Bishop Jenkins.